Welcome, everyone. I am Bob Wurzelbacher, the director of the Respect Life Office for the Arts Diocese of Cincinnati, and this is our video podcast series that we call Being Pro-Life. Each month, we discuss a different topic in the Respect Life arena, only a personal story from someone deeply affected by that issue, and finally, we'll share ways that you can get involved. This month's topic is on the drug crisis in our communities, and today we're talking about the connection between post-abortion trauma and drug and alcohol addiction. So as always, we have a special guest. Will you please introduce yourself? My name is Bettina DeFiore. I work with Pro-Life San Francisco in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I am a writer and researcher on abortion-related issues. Bettina, so start us off. Tell us a little bit about what you do with Pro-Life San Francisco. So we do activism of various sorts. We do sidewalk counseling. We we work with legislators to try to promote pro-life legislation. We do lobbying. Basically, we're involved in all aspects of pro-life activism. So why is it that you know something now about this whole connection between abortion trauma and substance abuse? Well, I'm post-abortive, so that was one reason why I'm interested in that issue. And I'm currently working on a project that is compiling all the research out there that shows the various ways that abortion harms women and also talks about different things that women can do to heal from that trauma. I don't know if we want to go too far on this stuff. It just reminds me, one of the early television shows that talked about abortion was Maud. And a character on that television show when they were talking about abortion was, it's like extracting a tooth. And you know... And so many other women, right, who have experienced abortion know that it is nothing like extracting a tooth, right? It is not. Terminating a pregnancy, that is a very different thing, and it it can be very traumatic. So, and then there's resources. We have a lot, and we can talk about that later. There's lots of resources Mm -hmm. out there to help women and men who have suffered the experience of abortion. So you're writing and doing research on this, right? Okay, so what can you tell us then about the connection between the trauma of abortion and substance abuse? Well, it is definitely connected. Women who have been through abortion are more likely to experience problems with substance abuse of all kinds, be it alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, you name it. There's a huge body of research out there that shows this connection. And I can talk about some of the individual studies if you're interested in that. One that's interesting talks about the the connection between pregnancy intention and substance abuse likelihood. So whether the pregnancy was wanted or unwanted. And this study is by Donald Paul Sullins, and it shows that women who had an abortion, whether they wanted the baby or didn't want the baby, were two times more likely to experience substance abuse issues later down the line than women who carried the term and did not have the abortion. So it didn't matter whether this was uh, like a fetal anomaly, so-called fetal anomaly pregnancy that they initially wanted to carry to term and then decided to terminate because of perhaps it was a Down syndrome baby or, you know, what have you, or whether this was an unintended pregnancy that they aborted because they simply just didn't want the baby. Both groups of those women had the same risk for substance abuse down the line compared to women who carried their babies to term. Wow, right. Right, so it doesn't, it didn't matter. If you have the abortion, your risk was increased twice as high. That's interesting. So it might've been the assumption people have. For example, there was a recent study called the Turnaway Study that followed women for five years following abortion. And it, it purported to study women who carried to term, who were turned away because they were too late in their pregnancies to obtain an abortion compared to women who got late term abortions. It purported to study their outcomes in terms of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, all these psychological issues. And it claimed that the women who were turned away had more problems than the women who had the abortions. And they claimed that these women who were forced to have unwanted babies are the ones who have the problems and that women who terminated, who wanted the babies are the ones who also had the issues. And that women who terminated unwanted babies, they don't have problems at all. You know, you follow up with them, they're fine. It's these other group of women who have problems, but that's not what research actually shows when the research is actually done in a sound manner with a large sample size with solid methodology, which the turnaway study was not. It was 
funded by people affiliated with the abortion industry, and they found what they wanted to find. Right. I was going to ask that if you could really, really briefly say what, what quickly in that study was makes it not a sound methodology. It was a small sample. Most of the women who they enrolled dropped out before the study was completed. The group that was supposed to be the control group, they were not a true control group for a number of reasons. They didn't control for a history of abortion, for one thing, which if you're purporting to study women who have a history of abortion versus women who don't have a history of abortion, you want to be sure that the women who supposedly don't have a history of abortion actually don't have a history of abortion. Right. But not just a lot, in one case, but don't have a history of abortion. Besides exactly. That. Because right. if abortion does affect you, then an abortion five years ago is obviously going to have an effect, not just the one in the now. Right. Also, problems with that study included the fact that the funders, the people who donated the money, were people who also are behind the abortion pill. They're the people who brought that to this country. They are investors in Danco, who are the manufacturers of the abortion pill. Their researchers themselves came from UCSF, which is basically the training facility for abortionists in this country. They're from ANSIHR, A-N-S-I-H-R, which is an organization that is promoting late-term abortions. That's their whole raison d'etre. And Diana Green Foster, the main researcher behind the study, she was actually the president of a late-term abortion organization. That was their whole agenda, was to inform people about late-term abortion, reduce stigma around it, and increase the number of providers of late-term abortion. So this study, which was designed to show that late-term abortion is not so bad, was really designed and funded by people who promote abortion. So it was not unbiased in any sense right. of the term. Right. So. You mentioned the abortion pill. The listeners are interested. We covered that topic pretty well in September of 2019. So if mm -hmm. people want to go back to the September 2019 topic, we talked about the effects of that pill and the ministry called abortion pill reversal. Mm -hmm. How women who have taken only the first of the two pill regimen can uh, receive the help they need to save their babies. Okay, so back to abortion trauma and substance abuse. So you mentioned one study that showed that whether the woman wants the child or not, if, if you know, as they say, right, if they're seeking an abortion or not, if they received an abortion, they are about two times more likely yes. to, to get involved with substance abuse in some way than those Correct. who carry pregnancies to terms. Was there a study that compared women who wanted a child and had mm -hmm. a child versus women who said they didn't want a child at first, wanted to seek an abortion, didn't get one, and ended up keeping the child? So David Reardon is someone who has studied abortion trauma extensively, including abortion trauma with substance abuse. And he did a study that followed women in adolescence, and he compared them to women who carried to term and who wanted their babies. So women who had abortions compared to women who just carried to term, the women who had the abortions were five times more likely to report subsequent substance abuse. Five times more likely. Five times. That's a 500% increase in risk. Wow. And compared to women who suffered a natural pregnancy loss, same study, they were four times more likely to experience substance abuse issues later down the line. Okay. So that would be compared to women who had miscarriages, stillbirths, right. that sort of thing. Right, right. So that's still obviously also very traumatic and people need to understand that as well, right? But the abortion yes. is even more traumatic. Yes. Miscarriage. Yes. That's part of the point of that study. Yes. And that's something that is often brought up that, oh, it's just, you know, it's a pregnancy loss. That's why they're having trauma. It's really not the same thing. Yes, it's a loss. Yes, it's something that women grieve. But there's, there's a difference of intent that makes a huge difference. There's a guilt factor that is amplified when a woman has an abortion, when she intentionally ends the life of her child. There's a haunting guilt that does not go away. Mm -hmm. And that is what women are trying to dull and numb with drugs and alcohol that is different than women who miscarry. A lot of women experience guilt around that as well, but it's, it's acute. Not, it's not long-term right. the way that it is with abortion. Yeah, because people come for, we run Project Rachel Minister here in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, and sometimes women wait for decades yes. before they come to seek healing for various reasons. And actually, usually it's 
often anyway, it's because, I mean, they bury that guilt so deeply. They bury it for so long. And they also don't feel like the church would welcome them if they did speak up. Right? They it, really do feel very condemned. It took um, me 27 years before I go. told anyone. 27 years. And I hope that the reaction when you were willing to tell somebody was a positive one that allowed, that helped you on your journey. But It was so different than what I expected. Okay. I was embraced rather than rejected. Okay. We're so glad to hear that. That's what the church is supposed to be about. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Christianity is supposed to be about. Okay, so back to, so you showed the ones that the couple of studies there. What else can we say about what we know about post-traumatic stress? So we have a study here from the National Comorbidity Survey Replication, 3,310 women. It's a nationally representative sample done by Natalie Mota and her colleagues. This is, uh, they calculated the percentage of respondents whose mental disorder came after their first abortion. So this is specifically pinpointing women who did not have problems prior to abortion, did have problems afterward. Now they studied depression, anxiety, other disorders as well. But one thing they found that was interesting was that substance abuse disorders, they had a 314 to 499% increase in likelihood that women would experience these things following a first abortion. That they would experience depression, anxiety. No, right? just substance abuse. That one oh, thing alone. Substance. Now, huh. anxiety and depression also showed an increased risk, but we're talking magnitude of 175%, 180% for anxiety, 175 for depression. We're talking 314 to almost 500% increase in risk for substance abuse. Wow. So this in particular is pronounced risk for women, even beyond affective disorders. Right. Three to five times as compared to what? Women who had children or what? what's the control group? Um, the control group are women who carried to term. Okay. Three to five. I mean, again, that's astounding. That is really powerful. Three to five times. Do we have a control group of like comparing women who had an abortion only to women who initially wanted an abortion, but didn't get one. The only thing I know of like that is the turnaway study, which I mentioned before, but it's, right. it's a flawed. Right. It would be great if someone would do a legitimate study on, <laughs> you know, with, with real methodology and an unbiased funding source, unbiased researchers. That would be great because there's a need for that. But I am not aware of anything like that that has a reasonable sample size and decent methodology. Right. It's certainly very interesting comparing how how things increase if you have an abortion, but I still wonder how much it might increase. I mean, the women I talked to who thought about abortion, but then changed their mind, decided to either keep the baby or or place the child for adoption. Either way, they always are glad, you know, none of them regret that decision, regret the decision to keep the baby. Now, And I will say that the turnaway study for all of its flaws One finding that they had that they didn't publicize was that although the women who wanted the abortion and were so-called turned away, they had increased initial anxiety. However, long-term, that leveled out. And they found that these women did not regret not getting the abortion. They didn't publicize that finding, but they did have that finding. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So you read that in the notes. That makes perfect sense. That's what you would expect. Of course, of course, the, the, the reason why you're, thinking about abortion is because you're you're anxious about it you're afraid you're you know there's, there's difficult you're in a crisis there's mm-hmm. difficult life situations going on you don't believe you can handle right. this baby who know the father's missing you know the family who know, all kinds of crises going on money here. could be a Stresses, problem money is an issue but, but women maybe. find that things do balance out they work out a new baby is an opening of a door and that can be a scary thing but god does provide the means to take care of the child, even if you cannot foresee as the woman what those might be. Right. I've heard so many stories of they were able to find this job they never thought they'd be able to find, right? Right. They got help from a family member that they thought was going to kick them out the door if they told them, and they had the opposite reaction. That's where organizations like Birthright can be so helpful that they connect women to resources that are out there that women probably don't even know exist. You know, and they pave the way to accessing these resources. They help women fill out the paperwork. They navigate all the red tape for them. They basically hold their hand through the process so that they can get to the resources they need to raise their children. 
Right. So Birthright, is that a national organization? That it is. Should... Mm-hmm. They have chapters nationwide. They're not the only one. They were just the first one that came to mind. <laughs> well, that's perfectly okay. The, I mean, this podcast is listened to all over the world. The vast majority, 70, 80% are in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, but there are people all over the place. So birthright. If you don't know where a local pregnancy care center is, for example, if you're in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, you know how to go to catholicaoc.org and then go to that Respect Life page and find that list. But if not, then you can look up birthright, I suppose, right? Is that a website, birthright? But if you Googled it, I'm sure it would come up. One word, right. birthright. Okay. So Brittany, let, let's talk a little bit more about this topic. So did, do you know anything about, or have you sent in a study talking more about illegal drugs, right? And not just say alcohol or something like that. So David Reardon, who I mentioned earlier as being someone who is sort of a, an expert on this, he's an authority on the research in this. He did a study with Priscilla Coleman and another researcher where they studied specific substances. They broke it down by substance. And they found that women who had the abortion versus women who carried an unintended pregnancy to term four years after the fact the women who had the abortion were two and a half times more likely to have cocaine addiction issues and two times more likely to be marijuana users than the women who carried the unintended pregnancy to term. Wow. Yeah. So even with heavy illegal drugs, talking two times more likely even with that. Yeah. And there was another study by David Ferguson and his colleagues, and he found that there was a 391% increase in the risk of illicit drug use by women who had had an abortion. This was a meta-analysis, which is when they take a collection of research done by other scientists and they basically analyze the studies. And I think he did a meta-analysis of 36 different studies. So he took the data that had been collected by 36 other scientists, ran the numbers, and those were the statistics that he came up with. Yes. Almost four times mm-hmm. as compared to women who delivered their babies, right? Yes. So, Brittany, we know from these studies, and I know from the women that I work with in our post abortion ministry, I hear similar things. But so, how can we, what can we do about this problem? So I think one thing is supporting the people who are providing help to women who have had abortions. So there are many, many ministries out there who are either dedicated to helping post-abortive men and women, or they have that as sort of a piece of what they do. And they need our help. You know, they need our financial support. They need our volunteer hours. They need people to come in and work with these women. And we are called to provide assistance to the church. And part of the church is also volunteer work for these organizations that are assisting these wounded people. So time, talent, and treasure, right? Whatever we're able to give, we should be giving that. But also, I think one in four women has had an abortion, and most of them are not talking about it. But if we know someone who has had an abortion, who is experiencing trauma, and everyone who's had an abortion is experiencing trauma, whether they appear to be or not, pointing them in the direction of those resources can be helpful too, you know, in a kind, loving, compassionate way. But also working just to end abortion in general, so that there are no more wounded people, ultimately, at some, you know, down the line. There are many cases right now that are heading toward the Supreme Court. There's one that's about to be in front of the Supreme Court, working to educate people, lobbying to help get this legislation passed. In cases like in Texas recently, there was a heartbeat bill that passed. You know, if you have legislation in your area that is being discussed, write to your senators, write to your representatives, express your support, your vote matters, go to the polls vote when there's pro-life legislation that's up. If you don't know, USCCB.org, if you click on take action link from there, um, that can take you to a page that will let you know about federal legislative things going on related to abortion. But we also need people on the sidewalks outside of clinics, you know, helping to convince women not to go in in the first place. And you can get trained as a sidewalk advocate. There are many organizations that do that. And if you feel called to stand outside the clinic and compassionately reach out and love to these women and try to help encourage them to make another decision, a a better decision, keep those babies, then by all means, we should be doing that. Right. And regular listeners remember that in February of 2020, we spoke with Abby Johnson and she gave that statistic that she's given many times, which is that at least there at Planned Parenthood, the statistic that they gave her 
was that when people are praying outside of a clinic, there is up to a 75% no-show rate for women who make appointments. So being outside the center and praying outside the center makes a difference in women choosing abortions. And there are several stories of people just have come to me. And how many would come to me in the first place? Not very many, but many have <laughs> many have come to me to give me that story. They tried to go or initially went to an abortion center and either after they were walking out or perhaps even because somebody was praying outside, they changed their mind, turned around, went to a pregnancy care center, and they do not regret at all making the choice for life, sometimes adoption, sometimes choosing to raise the baby, but in both cases, they do not regret that choice. So it makes a difference to pray outside of an abortion center. So that is one simple way to get involved. Because even if you don't, not trained as a sidewalk counselor, you can just go out there and pray. Exactly. Be a prayer for presence. Absolutely. Okay. And then, as you mentioned, Project Rachel is what uh, the Archdiocese of Cincinnati has in place. If you go to www.catholicaoc.org slash Project Rachel, you can see the ministry that's happening here in this Archdiocese, and you can choose to donate if you'd like. If you do, those donations to Project Rachel will go to helping fund the retreats because it's run by volunteers. It'll be help fund the retreats. It'll help provide scholarships for people that can't afford the cost of a retreat when they go in these retreats and could also go to advertising. Yes, that's so important because so many women are suffering in silence and in isolation, and they have no idea that there are even other women out there who are suffering. They think that there's something wrong with them for feeling bad about what they did. They think that other women, oh, they're totally fine with their abortions. Nobody else is suffering. And they need to hear that they're not alone and that there are resources that can help them. Right. And another way to support is you can just support your local pregnancy care center. Because first of all, they obviously work to help women in crisis pregnancy. So that's right there on the front lines of helping people avoid abortion. But they also, many of them also have post-abortion ministries and care as well. So you can support, volunteer with, you know, your local pregnancy care center. And that can also help to stop abortion from happening and help women who have had an abortion and need the recovery and need the help and need to find love and forgiveness and acceptance. We can provide both of those things. All right. Well, thanks for sharing with us about the connection between abortion and drug or alcohol abuse, that abortion is not just like removing a tooth, it is taking the life of a child, right? Which is why it can be so traumatic for mothers who find themselves being initially convinced, right, by the abortion industry that it's nothing and realize perhaps later that what actually happened. So hopefully we can help steer more women who are in crisis pregnancies toward pregnancy centers that actually exist to help both the baby and the mother. And at the same time, for the millions of women out there and fathers of that who have experienced the trauma of abortion, hopefully we can gear them to get the help that they need so they don't seek to null that pain through drugs and alcohol and other non-helpful ways. So thanks for spending time with us today. Thank you. And I want to thank all of our viewers and listeners for listening in on this episode of our Feeding Pro-Life series. Head to the website to check out the video version or the links talked about in this episode at www.catholicaoc.org slash Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to being with you next time.